Hey, good morning, Emmanuel Faith. My name is Jason Fuson, and I'm Navy chaplain here serving on the Theodore Roosevelt in Guam. As the beautiful sun sets behind me, it's my privilege this weekend to lead us in our call to worship. This weekend is Memorial Day weekend. We should remember the selfless sacrifice of our nation's veterans who fought to defend our freedoms and liberties, those things that we hold so dear as Americans. We applaud their sacrifice, and we admire their courage and their willingness to go and to stand watch on our behalf. For our call of worship this weekend, let me draw your attention to the words of Luke chapter 4, verse 16 through 19. It says this of Jesus. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus' followers at the time responded with enthusiasm. Israel had been waiting for a liberating king and a leader who would restore the prominence of the nation, both restoring religious and civil liberties to the people. How easy it would be to hear Jesus' words and to have missed the deeper meaning. On a national holiday like this weekend, it would be easy to look to the flag or to a monument instead of the cross or the empty tomb. This Memorial Day weekend, let me encourage you to both be grateful for the service members who have fought for us, and at the same, at the same time, to lift high the name of Jesus, who has given us true freedom. Because there's no greater oppression known to mankind than the bondage of sin and death and guilt. Satan used it to weigh down our very souls, and they feel the impact of distance from our Heavenly Father. To be liberated from the shackles of sin and death is the greatest victory ever won. We have much to be grateful for this weekend. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, as our nation remembers the cost our veterans have paid, and we be encouraged by the sacrifice, duty, and honor of the heroes that went before us, who have given the last full measure of devotion to defend the freedom we enjoy today. Freedom has always cost the ultimate price. It has cost the lives of soldiers, sailors, marines, and airmen. It has cost the lives of many saints around the world who have died martyrs' deaths for the advancement of the good news. But the most precious freedom mankind can ever fathom has been paid for by Jesus. May the freedom we enjoy as a nation continue to bring spiritual freedom to those enslaved to sin, that they might know the forgiveness of their sin that is offered to them through you, Jesus. May we be good stewards of the freedom that you have blessed us with, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray.
Yeah. 
Hi, I'm Missy Bell, the Global Outreach Director. Today we're continuing our series in Ephesians. If after the sermon you have any questions, go ahead and email questions at efcc.org or comment on Facebook and Instagram. Ryan will answer your questions on Facebook Live Thursday at 7 p.m. For the next two weekends, we'll be taking a special gift for those in our congregation who are in seminary. If you'd like to participate, go ahead and give online and choose Seminary Fund from the dropdown. Thank you for your generosity to our ministries. Besides the General Fund and the Seminarian Fund, you can give to Outreach. We continue to support 41 global outreach partners in 16 countries, as well as several local ministries. If you'd like to give to the Outreach Fund, just go ahead and choose Outreach from the dropdown online. Join me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you so much for this Sunday. Lord, we thank you for the word that you gave to Pastor Dave Hook. Lord, we ask that as we listen to this sermon that you would open our hearts and our ears to receive what you would have for us today. Lord, we ask that you would help us apply the message to our day through this week, God. And, and Lord, we look forward to the day where we can all be back together again. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now let's join Worship Pastor Dave Hook as he shares from Ephesians. Well, hello, Emmanuel Faith community. So glad you joined us for worship. Now, right up front here on the eve of Memorial Day, I wanna first begin by addressing those of you who had loved ones who have served in the military and have fallen in the line of duty. I'm praying for you and I'm praying God's provision for you, His sustaining grace, and that His abiding presence will be with you at this time. Well, here we are. We're in the final lap of our series on Ephesians entitled Revision. Now, I think Ephesians is really a summary of Christian thought, not just addressed to Asia Minor, but to the church universal. I think Paul had that in mind when he wrote it. And a lot of theologians have said the best way to read Ephesians is actually to take away all the chapter and verse numbers and just read it as one continuous letter or essay. So with that in mind, I want to read a couple of verses that Pastor Ryan shared with us last week in his message on marriage out of Ephesians 5. And then there were three key points that he shared with us that we're going to um, use as a springboard to launch us into our message for today. Ephesians 5, 1 and 2 reads this. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. And then a little later, we read this in verse 21 regarding the relationship between husbands and wives. Paul instructs us to submit to one another in love. Did you get that? Submit to one another, mutual submission. And here are the three points that Pastor Ryan shared. First of all, he said that our submission is a part of worship, total life orientation. And then he said that we no longer determine our conduct based on the culture or circumstances, but based on the model, the way of Jesus. And then number three, and this is the big one. He said our reverence for Jesus shapes every earthly relationship. It's this specific point that lays the groundwork for today's message. Now, before we go any further, I've got a little illustration for you that I think will really guide us along and frame the context of the message today just a little bit more. I wanna show you something. These are called 3D glasses. Uh, you've probably seen these when you go to Disneyland and do some of those 3D rides. Um, I prefer these. These are the ones I grew up with. And I gotta tell you, I love going to those blockbuster movies, Star Wars, Avengers type movies in 3D or even IMAX and just be immersed 
and that experience. I gotta admit, when you go back to the more two-dimensional ones, it's kind of disappointing. Now here's my point, here's the spiritual parallel. I think we're living in kind of a 2D world right now. I mean, I'm just watching the screen in front of me and everything just kind of parades by. Reports and charts and surveys and updates and rules and guidelines. And it gets a little blurry and a little distorted. I begin to wonder if all these second, third and fourth hand stories are really true. And I don't know if you feel that way. And I'm not sure where you are with your place of employment during this time of social distancing and, and stay at home orders. Um, I know some people I've talked with that are busier than ever. I mean, they are exhausted. They're, they're immersed and overwhelmed in their job. Still others are going, well, I'm just glad to still have a job. Some of you may almost be in tears. You miss your coworkers. You wanna go be with them. And yet I've even talked to some others going, hey, I kind of like this stay-at-home order. It's kind of a good vacation for me, a good sabbatical. And still some of you might be very worried, depressed, anxious, two-dimensional, not sure what to believe. You know, I think this message will have a little more relevance than we think it does at first glance. So let's look at this passage together and consider how it relates to the places we work and the people we work with, all right? Let's listen to Ephesians 6, five through nine. Bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bondservant or is free. And masters, do the same to them and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and there is no partiality with him. Now, I'll admit, in the past, when I would study the book of Ephesians and come to this passage, I would gloss right over it. I remember when I first read it as a young man who was studying the Bible, I, I don't know how to say it, I freaked out. I'm thinking, what is this doing in, in the scriptures? This doesn't apply to me. I don't believe in slavery. I don't live in a world of slavery, at least from my limited perspective. And so I would gloss over it. And then later on in life, I tried to pull out all the scholarly books and do all the word studies and kind of do research on the topic of slavery in the Bible. And I would just get overwhelmed with things. And this is why, because I think there's more than one way to approach God's narrative. You see, I was brought up in a, in a form of study that does this. I read the Bible, I look at some of the footnotes, I fill in the blanks of somebody telling me what to think. And then I say this, God, what does this say to me in my life right now? Don't misunderstand, a great way to read the Bible and keep doing that. But when we get to hard passages like this, rough patches in the Word of God, where we just have to kind of navigate through it, this much like a swampland, it gets really difficult to approach it from that perspective. You might have also, um, experienced what I did when I read it when I first began preparing for this message. I was taken back 150 years. I mean, slavery has been around with us since the beginning of time. I was taken back to the days of the Civil War. And by the way, just this past week on Wednesday, we remembered the Battle of Antietam. Some have said it was the bloodiest battle in history. 23,000 men died or were wounded in battle. And this changed the course of the Civil War. I got to thinking both North and South were praying for God to intervene and they were reading the same Bible. The Bible is not just about the immediate circumstances that I see. God's narrative, God's gospel story transcends time, national idealism and circumstances. We have to understand these things from God's perspective and plan for everyone. And when I take the time to superimpose this 3D imagery, God's gospel, looking at these things through the lens of the cross, 
glimpses of a whole different construct emerge, woven within the words and in the margins, so to speak, of this passage. Now, by the way, before I get any further, I want to invite you to join us this Thursday night. We're going to have a live stream. Pastor Ryan's going to be there, uh, Pastor Josh and myself, and we're going to talk about this very message and what the Bible says about slavery. But for now, I want us, I want us to put the glasses on, okay? I want us to look at this from a 3D perspective, the perspective of God and His plan for everyone. And to do that, you have to actually start with the end in mind. We're going to begin with verse 9 with the very last phrase that Paul says. He says, there is no partiality with him. Did you get that? Pastor Ryan talked about that last week as well. Have you ever heard this phrase? The ground is level at the foot of the cross. That applies here. You know, I think every Christian ought to read Ephesians 1 through 3 at least once a week and maybe make it a lifelong goal to, to memorize it. It's, it's sort of like a safe deposit box that explains who we are and what we've been given, all things. And it also reveals to us God's plan. What does God want to do? He's not hiding from us, and we see it very clearly. And this really lays the groundwork for this application about slaves and masters in Ephesians 6. Let me read a few verses for you. Let's go back to Ephesians 1. This is Ephesians 1, 9 and 10. It says that he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, get this, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth and under Christ. And listen to this, this is a portion of Ephesians 2, 13 through 17. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And then last of all, in Ephesians 4, stay with me here. I, Paul, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. What powerful passages. You see, in Ephesians 1 through 4, Paul lays out the who, what, when, and how, or what all have we been given in Christ by God's grace to the praise of His glory. He says that a number of times, to the praise of His glory, to the praise of His glory, all these things were given. And then in Ephesians 4, he tells us how to live at home and at work in relationship with one another. You see, it's out of the soil of these scriptures that springs a principle that should be woven, should be injected into the DNA of our spiritual makeup how we relate to everyone and everything. I call this the great invitation to join God's cosmic plan every day, making all things one in Christ. It's about God reconciling us to himself, making us one with him and one with one another. I mean, now think about this quickly, and I don't wanna to get too far down the path here, but as I read this and I see Paul talking to slaves and masters, I mean, your question had to arise in your own heart. Why didn't Paul just call for a revolt? Why didn't we just raise the sword and say, look, down with slavery, fight for your rights, fight for your freedom? Because Paul had 3D living in mind. He had God's gospel and perspective in mind. As a matter of fact, I wonder maybe if he struggled even as he wrote those very words. But he remembered that it was all about God reconciling us to himself. He knew that if he led people in that type of revolution, not only would have stifled the furtherance of the gospel, but maybe worked in complete opposition to it. It was all about the proclamation of the gospel of peace. I hear many people praying today for awakening, and I too have prayed for that. I, I remember when I first began with all this, I prayed that our churches would be filled again and there would be just great awakening in services. But I'm wondering now if the new vision is this, is that the great awakening, if it does take place according to God's will and plan, 
It's gonna happen at home and it's gonna happen in the neighborhood and it's gonna happen in the places that we work. So how does this play out for us? When we sit down to the computer screen this week or maybe, you know, praise God, we're able to get in our cars and go to work in the weeks ahead. Well, here's some thoughts um, I think might summarize and offer a 3D perspective. Let's just bring this to ground level right now, okay? Let's, let's talk about our relationship between employers and employees. I've got four key words for you, four key statements. This is the application of this passage. First of all, I want you to write down the word obey. That's what we're told to do. He says to obey your masters. And this is what I, this is what I think he means. Simply put, when your boss tells you to do something, act like Jesus told you to do it. When your boss tells you to do something, act like Jesus told you himself. Proverbs 1.7 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge. So you see this fear and trembling that Paul talks about in this passage is not being afraid of the CEO, your boss, or afraid of losing your job. It's holy fear, it's fear is unto the Lord. Jesus said, do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, rather, Fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. That's powerful stuff. The Bible says God is a consuming fire. We live in reverence, holy reverence, and honor and love for the Lord. It's like a moth being drawn to a flame. We know what that flame can do, but we're also drawn to the love of God. So let me, let me say quickly here also, you should never do anything your boss tells you to do that is illegal, or unethical or contrary to the word of God. That's not what we're talking about here. Otherwise, honor Christ. Do what your boss says. Second of all, the word focus. And we see this concept of focus in verses six and seven. You work for an audience of one. An audience of one. Nothing to lose nothing to prove, nothing to gain. That's what Os Guinness said in his book, The Call. I would suggest you read that. Serving an audience of one, nothing to prove, nothing to lose, nothing to gain. You see, focusing on who I work for and why determines how. It always shapes the how I work. Work is worship. Every day, your work is worship. There's a New Testament word that's introduced for worship. It's where we get the word liturgy, and it basically means service, service to the Lord. That's where we get our concept of entering into a worship service. But this worship service is different. It's, a, some, it's not something we go to. It's not an experience. It's an all-of-life way of living, orientation that we do. Many writers have actually called work liturgy our service of worship. And God's plan, his gospel, is the center of all that we do. We are called, I think, to be Christ incarnate. Now that may seem far-fetched, but after all, we are called the body of Christ. And get this, more than anything, know that your work matters to God. He sees you. He sees what you do. He sees your heart, even when no one else is looking. I mean, what does the old hymn say? Be thou my vision, riches I heed not, nor man's empty praise. Thou my inheritance now and always. Thou and thou only be first in my heart. High King of heaven, my treasure thou art. Next word is this, excellence. And here's what I want you to remember. I want you to go unfiltered. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, come with me. Let me show you something. So let me ask you a question. Which one of these cups of apple juice would you drink? Now, when I was a kid, I would have chosen this one. And if you served me this, I would have thought something was really wrong. I wouldn't touch that. And yet today, people spend a lot of time and money crafting such a product. Why is that? 
because we live in an organic, non-GMO, unfiltered world. You see, how we do something is just as important as what we do. And how we do something reflects who we work for. So this is my point. Sincerity means unadulterated, pure, unfiltered living and work. That is quality work. That is excellence. You see, as we abide in Christ and He in us and we obey His commands, He says that we will bear much fruit. We are called to produce as we abide in Him. And this is about an act of worship unto the Lord. And if our work is worship, then we should approach it the same way as we do everything else, with all of our heart and with sincerity of heart, pure, unfiltered, unadulterated. Now, I don't like to reduce the Christian life to a set of equations and formulas, but I did come up with something that I think reveals a pattern in this passage here. Listen closely, because I believe God does have a kingdom economy that we're a part of. Purity of heart, that's sincerity, plus consistent focus and obedient faithfulness multiplied by authentic from the heart passion produces a quality kingdom product. This is about excellence. You remember the passage that says that we are called to proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of the darkness into his wonderful light? Or even in Ephesians 2, where it says that we are his masterpieces, we're his poems, we're his workmanship created for good works in Christ. And this can happen even in the darkest, most oppressive, limited work environments. Listen, the Bible is filled with tons of people that showed up every day and humbly and faithfully worked with sincerity of heart, giving all that they had. And you know what happened? God showed up, God used them, and God touched a lost, unequal, unbalanced, dying world through them. This is excellence, my friends. Every day, we should do the very best we can with the very best we have for the very best reason. That leads to our fourth word, motivation. We are to live and work for the final day. It's been said that Martin Luther had this motto that he recite often, it went like this. I have but two days in my calendar, today and the day I stand before Christ. A two day calendar, boy, that's easy. Ecclesiastes 12, 13 and 14 says this. Now all has been heard, here's the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the duty of all mankind. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. At the end of our lives, when we stand before the Father, He's not gonna ask us what happened to you, but rather, what did you do? You see, we can pursue position and power and prestige, go ahead, burn yourself out. But at the end of your life, the Father's gonna say, okay, you got your reward. Or we can live for eternal value and perspective. Our work here and now can have that kind of worth. We can work in a way that is purposeful and motivating when we let this driving vision be this, this gyroscope, this true north that drives us forward. This is what gets me up every day to work, my friends, living for that final perspective. And with this 3D perspective in mind, we can keep going and we can produce fruit that glorifies Him here and now. Kingdom living, that's what we're called to do. So you might be asking the question, what about masters in all of this? What is their role? Well, it's very simple. Masters, employers, you do the same thing. See, the same principles apply as servants in this passage. Now remember, this act of mutual surrender is still key here. Mutual submission to one another. 
Galatians 3.28 says this, there is no Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, you are all one in Christ Jesus. I think the best way to lead is summed up in Galatians 5, 13 through 15. Listen to this. For you were called to freedom, brothers, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. And he says, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you're not consumed by one another. It's simply put, you wanna be a successful leader? Learn to serve them. Do what Jesus did when he said that the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Learn to love your staff. It's that simple. To see them the way Christ does, as image bearers, as those who've been redeemed and equipped and tooled in such a way to build up the place where you work. It takes time. It takes patience to do this. There's no magic formulas. There's no seminars or book you can read on this. It's just simply a matter of pouring into them, celebrating how they are wired up and how they fit the greater plan of what's going on in your workplace, partnering with them, and sometimes even letting them lead you. Now that's a concept. Remember, when you're leading, you lead with Jesus, who said, greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. That's true leadership. Well, as you can tell, we've spent a great deal of this time and this message in the back alleys of Escondido. And so I guess what I'm gonna share with you as my conclusion is my back alley story. You know, I've only known uh, two careers in my lifetime, teaching and church leadership. That's all I've known. I grew up in church ministry. But I'm gonna share something with you. I'd say for over the past 20 years, I've been coming out of a fog because for one reason or another, I've spent the majority of my life unhappy with my job. Now look, if you, if you looked at my resume, you'd see a number of churches that I've served at, places that we've been, and God genuinely led us to those places, we believe, and He blessed us in ways we could never, ever imagine, beyond anything we could ever ask for. And yet there were many, many times I was driven by disillusionment and discouragement, and I just didn't know why. Sometimes I just thought if I could change my circumstances, if I could just change my work environment, it would all get better. Does that sound familiar? Can you relate to that? That was my two-dimensional way of living. Now granted, things were never ideal. I mean, I didn't have the best mentors. I didn't always work with the best leaders. Too many heroes had let me down, too many roads and projects that were going nowhere, too many church models and ideas that came up that I was supposed to follow. And I always felt like I was trying to be someone or something that everybody wanted me to be. But I didn't realize this. Right from the start, I was enslaved. As soon as I began church ministry, I put my foot to the gas and I headed down a trajectory towards spiritual burnout and disappointment. But back in 2002, something very interesting happened to me. Some would say it was a breakdown. I mean, not literally. It was really more of a breakthrough. And God changed my way of looking at all of life and ministry. And it's been what some would call a slow revival ever since. And soon after that time, I was reading through Scripture and stumbled upon a passage, Exodus 21. Ironically, it talks about the relationship between bond servants and their masters. Let me read a portion of it for you. This is right at the beginning of the chapter. Now, these are the rules that you shall set before them. When you buy a Hebrew slave, he shall serve six years, and in the seventh year, he shall go out free for nothing. Complete freedom. See, the, the traditional form of slavery in the Old Testament and throughout the Middle East was called shetel slavery. The slave was purchased and became the property of the owner. But God made provision in every seventh year 
they were set free. Now, the moment I read this passage, I realized that this was a picture of my relationship to Jesus. And then all these verses came rushing in. The Holy Spirit began to bring to remembrance all these things. Verses like 1 Corinthians 6, where it says, you are not your own, you were bought with a price, therefore honor God with your body. Or even more so, as if I heard Jesus say to me directly from John 15, David, you did not choose me, I chose you, and appointed you to bear fruit, fruit that will last. Or even 2 Corinthians 5, it became personal to me to where it spoke of how the love of Christ compelled me to no longer live for myself, but live for the one who died for me and rose again. You see, this was a deliverance from slavery for me because I become so turned in upon myself, disillusioned, just driving, driving, going nowhere, finding my soul very empty and sick. Now listen to Exodus 21, one, uh, excuse me, five and six. This was the defining moment for me. It says this, but if the slave plainly says, I love my master, my wife, my children, I will not go out free. Then his master shall bring him to God and shall bring him to the door or the doorpost and his master shall bore his ear with an awl and he shall be a slave forever. No, you don't see an ear piercing, but I can tell you right now that passage pierced my heart because this is a picture of what I call sweet surrender, submission to Christ. And this revised, this revision, my whole way of looking at my life and ministry. Look, you and I, here's the bottom line. We're going to serve somebody. <laughs> the great theologian Bob Dylan had it right. You gotta serve someone. I choose Jesus. I choose him. I don't want to be free, my friends. You see, there have been moments in my life where I've forgotten this, still driving, still pressing ahead, still burning myself out. And in those moments now, Jesus comes along and invites me in. I take his yoke upon me, as it says in Matthew 11, and we begin to partner together and I begin to work with him. I've learned this. The more you fight for your freedom, the more you'll lose it. The more you try and gain control, the more out of control you will become. But the Bible says this, Whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it.
Well, as we wrap up things today, I really want to encourage you to think about this 3D perspective this week, looking at the world and the times we live through the lens of the gospel and, and God's plan to reconcile all things to himself in Christ Jesus. We're to live this narrative out at home and in the places we work. And what we do, we take on this calling as kingdom people, proclaiming his story everywhere, all the time and everything. And when we do that, Get this, a fourth dimension is opened up. And next week as we wrap up our revision series in Ephesians, Pastor Ryan is gonna talk about that as he speaks to us from Ephesians 6, 10 through 24. But until then, I wanna bless you and encourage you with these words from Colossians 3. Whatever you do, 
work at it with all your heart, as though you were working for the Lord and not for people. Remember that the Lord will give you as a reward what He has kept for His people, for Christ is the real master you serve. Grace and peace to you, Emmanuel Faith. We'll see you next week.